Hey, Vince McMahon, it's time for this week's Stick to Wrestling podcast. Who the hell do you think you are? Don't worry, be happy, because the Stick to Wrestling podcast is about to start. I want to thank Bobby McFerrin for writing that song about his favorite podcast, Stick to Wrestling, where if you give us 60 minutes, perhaps indeed, we'll give you a Raw Bone podcast. My name is John McAdam, and I have a question. Is there another Wicked Good podcast out there? How about we ask the 80s band Let's Active? Is there another Wicked Good Wrestling podcast out there? Let's Active was pretty big during my tour of duty at Newberry College. Hey, follow me on Twitter. Just put in the name John McAdam and follow the guys who are fighting with chairs. Uh, Also, we have a Facebook group. Just put in Stick to Wrestling and you will find it. Let me create an example of why you should be on the Facebook group. Richard Conroy asked me a question. It was a long answer, so I figured I'd answer it on the show. Okay. He asked, Larry Zbysko, should Larry Zbysko have had a run with the WWF title after turning on Bruno Sammartino a long time ago, like more than 30 years ago, I was speaking with a WWF wrestler who was around the territory at that time, and he told me that that was the plan, that Larry Zbysko was going to get a run with the WWF title as a babyface. That's why he and Bruno shook hands at the end of the cage match at Shea Stadium. And I'm not sure what happened. I don't know if Vince Sr. just decided Backlund was drawing better and why shake a good thing up or what happened. I don't know if Larry Zabisco, who claimed that he got fired from the WWF after the Shea Stadium show when he complained about his payoff, That didn't happen. He wasn't fired from the WWF. He was still around until like January, February, 81, but they never brought him back and he was conspicuous by his absence. So something went sideways, but that's why I wanted to share with you guys. That's the wrestler told me that Larry Zabisco was going to get a run. That was going to be the whole point of his feud with Bruno Sammartino. But anyway, this show is coming out on October the 16th and I want to wish a happy birthday to Missy Hyatt, who is not only responsible for the nationwide tissue shortage in the mid to late 80s, but she really knows her wrestling and she gets the business for real. So, Missy, happy birthday. Right now, I want to bring on a guest who has not been on in far too long. Good friend of mine, good friend of the show, Brad Breitzman. Brad, thank you for taking the time. Thanks for having me back on. It it has been a little while, and um, I've been looking forward to being back on, and I appreciate the invite. No problem. We appreciate you being here. It's been long enough, Brad. I want to refresh everyone's memory. Like, when and how did you first become a wrestling fan? Let me throw this out there, too. Brad grew up in the Midwest, AWA territory. Yes, I did. Um, Minneapolis, just Western. Um, I don't have the card written down in front of me in the first show I went to, but I, can, I, can, I remember most of it. It was, it was uh, 1981. It was October 9th, 1981. With your main event of Nick Bockwinkle against Billy White, uh, Chica and El Casey. <laughs> and uh, actually, that wasn't the main event. The main event was a tag match between Ganya and Brunzel against Ventura and Adonis. That one on last. And uh, there was a Blackwell Brad Riggins match. And it was also Hogan's first night in AWA. And he beat three opponents. Uh, Nacho Barrero was one of them. I can't remember the others because they're not memorable. Um, <laughs> they're but- not important. No, no. He came out by himself, didn't have Jimmy Valiant or anything, or Johnny Valiant, rather. Johnny Valiant. He didn't have anybody with him, and the fans just kind of took to him. He took off his, his robe or his, his cape, I should say, and the whole the whole building just kind of went, ooh. And, and that was the beginning of the, the whole success thing for Hogan. I started reading magazines before I went to my first shows. My, um, my late grandmother kind of got me into wrestling. Because we'd be over there on Sunday mornings, and that's when it was airing. So, um, yeah, that's kind of how I got into it from the beginning right. there. Yeah, it sounds like you and I started going to house shows right around the same time. I started regularly visiting the Boston Garden in 1981. Wow. That, that takes some, some, you got to be a pretty brave person to, to go in the old Boston Garden. <laughs> 
<laughs> but yeah, nineteen eighty one. Nineteen eighty one was a great year for wrestling. I you know. It really I was. Agree. And I was lucky. I was lucky to to have my dad buy me those two tickets. That, that <laughs> absolutely excellent. And believe me, I didn't I did not venture into that Boston Garden alone, believe me. Hey, I want to start with this. You have a cool story about the night I have not heard the story yet, about the night Otto Vons won the AWA title and Bobby Heenan's reaction to it. Yeah. That was uh August twenty ninth. 1982 at the St. Paul Civic Center. What happened that night was the title change was set up. Vern had been paid by Otto. Everybody knew. Um, everybody that was in the match knew. Heenan, earlier in the show, had a match against Ray Stevens, where Heenan did the thing where he pulled off the bar of soap, brass knuckles, went to hit Stevens. Stevens takes it away, hits, hits Heenan. Heenan does the flip bump and cuts his head, top of his head off. So, as far as Heenan knew, he was going to be coming out to the ring with about five minutes left in the match with his head bandaged up, which is exactly what did happen. And Otto and Nick were stumbling all over each other. And Heenan comes out, you know, towards the end of this match. And Heenan is not in on the finish. They didn't tell him. Heenan thought that the finish was going to be something different. If you see a tape of the match, it's very clear. He trips Otto's legs, takes Otto's legs out from underneath him, under the bottom rope. And Bachwinkle falls on Otto. One count, two count, Otto kicks out. Heenan flashes a, you can see this on the tape. Heenan shoots a look over to Wally Carbo sitting at the table, about uh, 10 feet away from him, as if, what, what's going on here? And uh, about two, two more sets of moves, and Otto went over. He didn't be in the professional that he was, went in the ring, went berserk, you know, started shaking the ropes and going crazy and bleeding all over. And uh, Otto never got a hold of him, but that was the plan that Otto was going to get a hold of him. Bachwinkle was going to be pinning Otto as far as Heenan knew. But Heenan did not know until he got to the back. And in his books, he talks about that, you know, that was a, he feel, felt really betrayed by that. And that it, it, he didn't, th- didn't think it was a very cool thing to do. And I, I, I got to agree with him. So I, I haven't read Heenan's book in a long, like a long time, like 15 years ago. It's time for a reread because that was a good book. Yeah, it certainly was. The first one was the best. Oh, yeah. yeah. The first one was excellent. I, I forgot he had two books. But, yeah, I haven't read either of them in like 15 years. It's, it's time to do that again. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm the biggest Bobby Heenan fan there is, I believe. I truly do believe and i got to know bobby a bit you know in his waning years and towards the end of his life but no that's the story i understood uh there's another little story attached to that match too if i could expound on that Uh, totally i love stuff like this mick karch was a still is he's a lifelong wrestling fan started out just being uh he started out being the president of the nick bockwinkle bockwinkle brigade fan club and then he oh, worked wow. his way, way up to, um, yeah, this is in the mid-70s. Worked his way up to being a ringside photographer. And then in the waning days of the AWA towards the end, he was an announcer. Really good guy. Still around. He, has a, he had a convention for AWA fans about a year ago that was really well received. But anyway, Mick Karch ran the Bachwinkle Brigade fan club. And he had to do the planning on all this. And he had a wrestling convention in 1982, which is probably a good 20 years before its time. So he had people come in from all over the country, flying in, and they're going to be able to see Nick Bockwinkle defend his title against Otto Vons this night. Mick went to great lengths to make this something special, so he had Nick come out and meet with the fan club beforehand, which is something that was really a strange thing when you think about it in 1982 with Kayfabe. Mm. But he came out and he met these all these people, and then these people are here to see Bockwinkle perform, and they catch him on the night he loses the bell to Otto. So uh, it's crazy that way. Mick was very embarrassed. So <laughs> it was, uh, it, it was, it ended up very crazy in that sense. While we're on the subject of Mick Karch, were you at the show that Dennis Caraluzzo promoted out there? I want to say 1983, oh. 1993, excuse me. Yeah, I think it, it was. Indian Center. Yeah, like Eddie Gilbert and Road Warrior Hawk. Yep, I was there. Okay. Was there. Because Mick did the uh, the backstage interviews 
And I don't know if he was hilariously bad or hilariously fantastic. His his overreactions to everything were just off the charts. It was great. Uh, he's got a great sense of humor. He he did a really good job when he was an announcer. He just kind of didn't have the opportunity at the right time, or else I think he would have would worked out fine. But yeah, he was he was a bit of an overreactor. He was came from the Marty O'Neill school of business, and you know, yeah. um, wonderful guy, wonderful guy. Let me ask you this. I'm, I'm throwing you a curveball here. As a fan growing up watching this, like, how was your reception to this guy, Otto Vons, by coming out of nowhere, it appeared, to win the AWA title? Well, they kind of set it up on television where Otto was out there uh, for a TV match, um, ripping phone books. And, uh, of course, then the Heenan family tried it and they couldn't do it. You know, they, they, they bloodied up Otto and that kind of led to his match with Bachwinkle. Uh, what did I think? I was not there that night at the Civic Center. It was a rare time I wasn't there. What did I think of it? I, I, I don't know. Otto was, I dare say he was over. The videotape shows that there's a pop in the arena. You know, there's no booze or beer cups flying in the ring. What did I think of it? I, I don't know. I didn't know what to think of it because Otto was not the most athletic looking gentleman ever. But he, he the, the, Bachwinkle got, got the belt back like six weeks later or something in Chicago. So it didn't really even affect a single house show in Minneapolis, I don't believe. Otto made no title defenses in Minneapolis or St. Paul that I can recall. All right. Yeah, I remember seeing it in the magazines, and my first reaction was, okay, there's no way this guy's keeping the title. Uh, yeah. but my second reaction was, to me, it kind of made the AWA look like a more prestigious title, that they brought this guy in from Austria, and yep. You know, he comes in and wins the belt. I thought it made it made the AWA actually look good. Yeah, well, they had the international flavor, as Nick Bachwinkle would say. You know, they did the same thing with Jumbo uh, a couple years later after that. That's right. Years. But Otto, once the title reign ended, he kind of disappeared. And I, it was a business deal between he and Vern. And that's just kind of the way it happened. I, I'm sure that Nick Bachwinkle knew that he was regaining the belt very soon after he had put Otto over for the title. One thing they curveballed me with when Jumbo won the title, yeah. I was like, okay, well, Nick's going to win it back again, just like he did with Vons, you know, with whoever else. And bang, Rick Martell is the guy who wins the title from Jumbo Saruta. And, and to me, that's good booking because Nick Bockwinkel can just say, Hey, Rick Martell never beat me. Yeah, it, that's true. And, and as legend has it, Bockwinkel was the one that lobbied for Martell to get it with Vern because Bachwinkle was so high on Martell and Martell was a magnificent worker by that time. Oh yeah. Pure, pure baby face, but he was, he was a magnificent worker by that time. And he and Jumbo had uh, two matches in St. Paul, the title change. And then I think a rematch if, if I'm not mistaken. And they were both tremendous matches. So I yeah. believe it. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're looking at two elite workers here now. What was your reaction to Rick Martell winning the AWA title? Well, when he got it, I remember the matches were good. And Martell was as good a worker, uh, as good of a champion as Nick was, certainly not for nearly as long. But Martell got the belt when the shine was a little bit coming off of it, if you know, Mm. in a manner of speaking. He just, he had weak opponents. They put him in against Brad Ringens. They put him in against Bob Backlund and that dude. Yep. And Michael Hayes, who, um, you know, had a controversial finish with him in St. Paul and had to kind of hold up the belt, as I recall, if I recall correctly. But he didn't have the opponents. But Martell was certainly wonderful. And, and, and when Martell would wrestle Bachwinkle even after that, those two would have outstanding matches. I came across on a wrestling tape. I don't know who I got it from. Could have been some bum someplace. But uh, I got I had a wrestling <laughs> tape in. It was tremendous because it was Martell as AWA champion, and he was defending the belt in Louisville, Kentucky. And he was against Lawler. Def- against Lawler, and Martell was playing heel. And it was interesting because I know Rick Martell went on to be a heel in the WWF uh, as time went by in a totally different capacity. But it was kind of interesting to see him play a, a not so subtle heel against Jerry Lawler. So that was cool. I, th- I thought he could have been a tweener champion better. But AWA, was, the parking brakes were stuck on at that point, I think. It was just the bad timing. 
Yeah, I remember seeing that match for the first time. And you know that like little celebratory dance Rick Martel does, you know, as a baby face? He yeah. did it as a heel in Louisville, and it was absolutely fantastic. It was like, oh, wow, <laughs> this is great heel work. Right, right. And they started out pretty clean, and then he'd stop making clean breaks. And, he, you know, because you, you, Martel was a veteran by then. I think he broke in in 73 or 74. He knew yeah. what he was doing. But he, but yeah, that thought man, that match always was stuck out in my mind because seeing Martel in that role was interesting. Now you see, I I bought Rick Martel as a world champion. I, I put aside the fact that you know I'd seen him lose just three years earlier to guys like Morocco and Angelo Mosca out here. I'm like, okay, well, he, you know, he's young. He got better in those three years. Like I bought him as a world champion, like alongside Rick Martel and Hulk Hogan. Yeah, definitely. He, I mean, he really, he was very refined by the time he got the belt. And, um, and it, if they only had had better opponents for him, I think it would have worked better. But that was when the, the Civic Center was starting to starting to have more empty seats every every month. So it's it's hard to say. Yeah, I, I agree with you that they used the wrong opponents for him. I mean... To me, the AWA just didn't have its finger on the pulse of the business. You know, down the street or, or wherever, uh, on a different night, you've got Hulk Hogan and Dr. D. David Schultz bleeding all over each other. Right. And then you're out there with Rick Martell against Brad Rangins or Bob Backlund. Well, that's because Vern wanted to have a wrestling promotion. He wanted to put on a wrestling show. And it stunted the growth of the business for them. Because, yeah, because pe- Hogan had made the job, obviously. No, I mean, you know what? That's actually a good point. Like, a good thing to do might be to lean towards product. What's the word I'm looking for? Product differentiation. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you know, you look back at what the WWF did in 92 with Bret Hart when they put the title on him and they're like, okay, we need to get this guy over. They were putting him against, you know, not t- top of the, sh- the shelf heels, but like the next level down, guys like the Barbarian, and Brett was beating them on TV. I thought Rick Martel needed a super push like that, and he didn't get it. Yeah. Yeah, he, they, they tried, but they just didn't have the roster depth at that point. I mean, when you've got him out there doing a series against Michael Hayes, something is probably... There's probably some desperation, and not not no knock on Michael Hayes, but there's probably some desperation there. Yeah, you see, I I saw Michael Hayes and Terry Gordy as top notch guys. Like I would have bought, I I absolutely would have bought or did buy Michael Hayes as a serious contender for the AWA title, just as I would have bought him as a contender against Hogan and Flair. Yeah, you, you he's, he was believable in that sense, and you could have bought him, but. There's no way in hell Vern would have put the belt anywhere near him because those guys were partying pretty hard by that time. Oh, I, I, by I, 1984 the or, or 85, these the stories were starting to pile up. Hey, you mentioned that you were a huge fan of Bobby Heenan. Yep. I mean, were you watching by the time he left the AWA in 1979? Yeah, I was watching then. He did the thing where he attacked uh, Wally Carbo and they banned him. He got barred and he got thrown out of wrestling and he shows up on Georgia TV. <laughs> that, that's, that's another thing. I mean, the, by that point, these guys had to realize that, you know, cable was a thing and if Keenan's banned from pro wrestling for life and he shows up on cable, that's a problem. Yeah. Well, I didn't have cable till the late summer of 82, but a lot of people did. And there wasn't a whole lot of crossover. Cause cable wasn't really huge in the twin cities. I know by that point, but uh, yeah, it, if he's barred and he, I guess that he was banned from the AWA is probably the way the way they worded it. But he showed up right. and he, you know, with Bobby Heenan, you know, it, the story's very clear and out there. Bobby Heenan wanted national exposure. He would worked very hard for over a decade, by probably 15 years. He'd call Vince every six months, but he, Vince didn't have a spot for him. And he saw an opening in Georgia to go down and work for Ole. This was, which is flawed logic, probably. And so he went down there, and he was on WTBS every week. And he did a good job. You know, he, he was he was Heenan. He had a stable. He would bleed all over. He did everything, you know, that, that you would expect from Heenan. And then he bought a house, and that didn't sit too well with either Barnett or Ole. I don't know. 
and they let him go. So back in he came. <laughs> And I always thought that was a weird story. Uh, Bobby had told the story on Dave Meltzer's Wrestling Observer Live that Ole told him, oh, no, you're going to be here as long as you want to. Move your family down here. Buy a house. And as soon as Heenan bought the house, they let him go. Yeah. And Ole admitted that Heenan hates him to this day for it. But that did happen. As it kind of, as we're just staying with an AWA theme a little bit, I will point out, though, that while Heenan was down there for that, uh, gosh, I want to say about 11 months. Lord Alfred Hayes was in as a manager, as the heel manager, and he did an outstanding job. Al Hayes as a, as a heel manager was tremendous. Not, I mean, some of the younger viewers and, and things like that that haven't seen, been exposed to him as a manager, that have only seen him on the couch next to Vince, he was a terrific, snooty, British, uptight sort of manager role. And so when Heenan came back from Georgia, they turned Al, Al Hayes babyface, and they had a series of loser-leave-town matches, and that's where Al Hayes left, and he didn't got his spot back. I mean, everyone who listens to this show knows what a big fan I am of early 80s Lord Alfred Hayes. He was phenomenal sure. in Florida. And I, I've seen footage of Heenan in Georgia. You know, it's, it's actually some of his best work, in my opinion. Yeah, he was great at everything he did. He really he was. was. All right. Hey, let me get your thoughts on. So when Heenan came back 10, 11 months later, I mean, how did they explain that on TV? They did a pretty elaborate angle because they'd had Jardine in as Super Destroyer. And then they'd had Neil Gway and they had Sergeant Slaughter as the Super Destroyers Mark Two and Three. And Heenan just kind of showed up, came in the ring on television. And it was Super Destroyer Two. So that would be Slaughter. And he said, and he just kind of claimed him. He said, come with me, and, you know, and then Slaughter turned on Hayes. And then it, Heenan and Hayes got into the program they did. But, you know, he was back. I don't know that they really acknowledged his Wally Carbo imposed, you know, banishment. But he was just back and he was Bobby and they had great matches and Bobby was always healing. And, and the fans really took to Al Hayes as a baby face then. So and then he had wow. a leave town match. And I remember the interview very well. Al Hayes came out and he said, you know, I made a lot of good friends in this area and I've enjoyed my time, but it's time I move on. And it was, you know, kind of poignant, as, as if you can call a wrestling interview poignant. But it was done well. It was done really well. And then Heenan was put back with Bockwinkle. And then we, about a, uh, seven or eight months later, we had the Vern Bockwinkle situation. So, uh, yes, <laughs> which is. One thing I want to talk about, but let me ask you before we move on to that, what was your reaction when Bobby Heenan left the AWA for the WWF in 1984? Hated it. I hated it. I knew it was happening. I was there on his last night. They had a six-man tag with the weasel suit stipulation. Whenever, whichever team lost the match, the crowd by their volume, whoever they voted for by volume had to wear the weasel suit. And I knew it. I was at ringside. I was by myself that night. And I knew that was his last night in. And uh, WWF was running at the Met Center in Bloomington. And a lot of my high school friends that by that time were going. And I just said that morning, I said, Heenan was there, wasn't he? And they said, yeah, Heenan was there. My reaction, I knew it was coming. They stuffed him in the weasel suit one last time. He fulfilled his dates. And I was really disappointed because... I didn't like what WWF was doing to the characters that I grew up loving. And Heenan, by that time, was ready to kind of stop working, even though he did continue. But, yeah, I was disappointed. But I, I could see it coming a mile away. Wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I remember the first time he was on TNT, and that's how he got his introduction to the WWF. I was, I was blown away because, I mean, it had been a certain way out here for so long. The managers were Lou Albano, Grand Wizard, and Fred Blassie. And uh -huh. my reaction is, wow, they're replacing the Grand Wizard with Bobby Heenan. When the reality is, no, they're just signing everybody. Yeah. And that hurt Vern's business. I mean, everybody they took hurt Vern's business. Even guys you wouldn't think, like Okerlund. Big, big, big hole left when Gene left. Big hole was left behind. I mean, and, you know, Vince was ruthless. He, he would take guys just to stick it to Vern that he didn't even yeah. really need. But Heenan had the talent, and Hogan apparently got Heenan work into WWF with Vince. He made the phone calls that were necessary, as the story goes. 
And Heenan was just delighted because he was going to be on national television. He was making three times as much money as Vern was paying him. And Heenan always never had any complaints about Vern's payoffs, though. So, yeah, he, he got to go there, and he was on TV every week. National television. I'm, I mean, you mentioned this the last time he was here. I mean, he was Hulk Hogan. Like, the Hulk Hogan-Bobby Heenan feud was probably WWF feud of the 1980s. That's the vote I put in, I think, back yeah. in the early show I did. Heenan always had somebody to go up against him, and that kind of climaxed with Andre. But, you know, there were guys after that, too. But by that time, I think Bobby was moving more towards prime time with Gorilla. Yeah, I mean, I had heard, you know, throughout the 80s that Bobby Heenan wanted to be less involved as a manager and get out of that role and be a commentator. And he finally got that right around 1990. And they brought him kicking and screaming out of retirement for at least a little while when Ric Flair was coming in. And I mean, what does that say about Bobby Heenan? You've got Ric Flair. It's Ric Flair. He's coming in. And they're like, Bobby, we need you one more time, bro. Yeah. Yeah. And Bobby Heenan and Ric Flair both were notorious for being able to tip a few back or a few hundred back um, <laughs> through their careers. So by that time, I think Bobby was in his early 40s. And he'd had the broken neck. And, uh, you know, he had. they brought him out to work with the Ultimate Warrior. And, you know, that's that had to have been hell. But, oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, the story is, Keenan tells it in his, they put him in the Hall of Fame, his induction speech. He makes a joke about, you know, not being able to handle the road with Flair. That it was too much. So, <laughs> yeah. Those, I guess those guys knew at a party, that's for certain. The, you know, the, the stories from the from the eighties in wrestling are, are pretty phenomenal. In nineteen eighty, uh, Vern won the title back from Nick Bockwinkel. What was well? First of all, what was your reaction to that as a fan who watched on TV? Okay, I was purely a TV watching fan at that point. You know, I know a lot more now, but Vern was kind of the hometown hero type of guy. He won it on July eighteenth, nineteen eighty, in Chicago at Comiskey at an outdoor show. And my reaction was, like, I don't know. I miss Vern's heyday, which was, I don't know, 1962. <laughs> but, you know, it was, you know, they had the, the thing with the sleeper holds. They claimed that each other's hold was a choke, and they both used the sleeper. But Vern won the belt in 1980 at Comiskey, July 18th. He was champion for 305 days. And they used him more in tag matches, which was a fault of the AWAs. But most of his single title defenses were against Jerry Blackwell. And we went over clean in most of those. Vern didn't work a lot from 1970 to 75 when he had the belt, for that matter. But a lot of tag matches. And then, you know, it leads into the his retirement match and went on from that. But uh, yeah, he, Vern had the belt for 305 days and probably defended it at the Civic Center three or four times. Oh, That's man. All. Yeah. What did they have instead of the AWE world title? Did they bring out uh, Ventura and Adonis as the main event? Yes. The AWE okay. was, a ta- was a tag team, especially during those years. Uh, from Well, basically, in the early 70s, it was a tag promotion. And then whenever Vern had the belt, it seemed to be a tag promotion. And the High Flyers and Ventura Adonis were a very, very hot ticket during that time period for certain. But they would do this with Bockwinkle, too, and I was going to get to that in my notes. But anyway, they used way too many six-man tags. I had never liked six-man tag matches. They were always to set up something for somebody to get a shot against Bockwinkle. But they would put Bockwinkle in these six-man tag matches as a champion. He didn't defend that often. You'd think every month he'd have a different, a different title defense, but he did not. He only worked, you know, X amount. Is that all right if I go into that? How? Uh, oh, yeah, I'd love to hear about that. His decree. Okay. On the 10th of May, they had the retirement match at St. Paul Civic Center. The infamous match, the stinkeroo match between Bockwinkle and Vern Gagne, with the excellent story of Vern Gagne firing referee Doug Gilbert in the middle of the match. Have you heard that story before, John? No, I have not heard that story. How can <laughs> you have to tell me this story? That I've not heard that. Okay. Knowing what I know, and I heard this from Mick Karch many years ago, but if you watch the tape, if, if, you know, if you're so inclined, Vern gets really pissed off at Doug Gilbert, who's refing, because there was a choke hold being applied, and he wasn't checking to see if it was a choke. 
uh, the, the referee and Vern says, you know, God damn it. It's a chokehold. You know, you got to check this and you can see on the tape, Vern is chewing, chewing Doug Gilbert's ass a bit. And, uh, he said, you'll never work here again. And he never worked here again. <laughs> oh my. And then they went on for the rest of the match. Vern wins it, I think, with a back suplex, something really slow motion. And so that's the 10th. And then on the date I have down is May 19th, which is nine days later. Stanley Blackburn, by executive decree, declares Nick Bockwinkel champion without having a tournament, without having a match, just because he was the number one contender when Vern retired. I remember reading about that in the magazines. And well, first of all, Vern's retirement got a whole lot of mainstream yep. coverage in Minneapolis. I mean, I remember getting a tape that was like an hour and a half of nothing but like TV coverage of, you know, on the news. You know, this is Vern Gagne's last match. And then they they would show highlights of what happened that night. I mean, we never got anything like that out here. They filmed video like vignettes with people like Don Rickles congratulating Vern Gagne on a great career. And, you mm-hmm. know, you're, it's Don Rickles, so you're waiting for him to say something. Of course he did. He's like, I don't follow wrestling because they all have problems. Uh, but, but, you know, that, that did happen. And, yeah, they made a huge deal out of it. C- Civic Center was sold out. I know my, my old friend Wade Keller, that was his first match he ever went to, first card he ever went to, and he beat me on by a couple months that way. But, yeah. Vern pinned Nick clean, and nine days later, Stanley Blackburn declared Bachwinkle the champion again. Now, where they went from there uh, is a little bit interesting if you want to get into that, too. Yeah, totally. Okay. So, May 19th, Bachwinkle's declared champion. He only defended the belt once. His first defense as its champion in Houston against Wahoo McDaniel on the 7th of June. He was not on the AWA card, Minneapolis Auditorium. On the 11th, they used him against Jim Brunzel in Winnipeg. And there's the story that's gone around for a long time that, that when they take a little bit of the heat off of the decision, they had uh, Bachwinkel go straight and do a program with Adnan Casey and where he, Bachwinkel would get babyface heat, which is what, they, what, what he did. But on 628-81, which is a couple of months before they put him against Adnan, he had a title match against Baron Von Raschke at the St. Paul Civic Center, where Nick basically pinned him clean. So that wipes out that theory. And then he went up to Calgary Stampede on the 3rd of July and wrestled Bret Hart. They didn't really push him too much. He had a 60-minute Broadway with Brunzel on the 16th of July, and he uh, went against Buck Zumhoff. I don't know. We might have to edit that out. Uh, <laughs> in San Francisco, he had a match against Zumhoff. And then the 8 9 uh, in August, my first show, they put him in there with Adnan. So that was only the second time the Twin Cities had seen him do a title defense in five, six, seven, in three months. So it worked pretty well. I was going to say, that's pretty amazing that I, that they, not only did they do that, but I never pieced together, ah, oh, that's why they, they're doing this with Sheik Adnan Al Casey, to take the heat off of that decision. I thought as someone who, you know, I couldn't follow the AWA anywhere, but the, the okay. magazines, I mean, I thought that was just horrible what they did. I mean, they say, okay, Nick Bockwinkle's the number one contender, so we're putting the title on him. How can he be the number one contender when he just lost clean in the middle to Vern Gagne? And they had the tape that was supposedly in Amarillo, where Stanley Blackburn's office was, where Nick Bockwinkle had his Hollywood shades on, and, and Heenan was there, you know, thank you, Mr. Blackburn. They were, you know, all nice to him and stuff like that. And then they'd cut back to the, the studio here, and Vern would come out with his USA, you know, pullover jacket. I just don't understand. This is this is just illogical. A tournament is, you know, it's not that difficult. It happens all the time. And, and he, so Vern, you know, had to come in and, and say that he didn't approve of it. Of course, it was his idea. But, <laughs> but uh, that, that's what they did. But they went so far in that Adnan series of three matches that they did around the horn is that they didn't even bring Heenan out because they didn't want any doubt in anyone's mind who the babyface was. Heenan didn't make an appearance until the third blow off match. And he got conked with the sword before the match started. And he went to the back, came out with the wrapping around his head, bleeding. And, you know, the special ref was Rashke. And then Fern, uh, Nick finally pinned Adnan. 
in just in the third match after Adnan had slaughtered Bockwinkle in two bloody matches of the first two of the series. So, yes, it worked pretty well. Bockwinkle got a huge pop when he pinned uh, Adnan in, in Minneapolis Auditorium, though, that third match. There was no question. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I mean, I am not, as time has gone on, I am not a big fan of tournaments because you have to job out most of your promotion. I mean, even if you get away with, okay, well, this match went to a draw, so both guys are out. That one went to a DQ. You are jobbing a lot of guys in one night. But to me, there was no reason they couldn't have had, you know, a number one versus number two contender match to give the thing a little bit of credibility. I mean, when I saw that, I was just like, do you guys know how to run a promotion? Come on. It was bad. It was very bad. It made him look bad. You know, fortunately, fortuitously, it was Nick Bockwinkle. So, you know, he carried himself as a champion. He worked as a champion. And, uh, you know, that took some of the sting out of it because he was that good. But, yeah, it, yeah, it was it was a bad position and it wasn't it didn't didn't come off well. I mean, I can get the argument that, hey, this guy was good enough to hold the title for almost five years. You know, he can't yep, be that times. bad a wrestler. But at the same time, yeah, I, I just disagreed with the booking strongly at the time i guess i can forgive it a little bit now mm-hmm. yeah i mean i don't really know that they had a plan in place i mean hogan was coming in they didn't know how he was going to pan out he didn't pan out in any way they thought he would he got way older right. but uh you know and he had which valiant brother johnny valiant as his manager which didn't work at all and he was gone because they wanted him to be a heel hogan couldn't talk and you know all this stuff and he learned all that in the awa so that was his first success. You know, Hogan floundered uh, in the business for several years. I mean, he, he was on a Shea Stadium show against Andre. And I mean, he just wasn't that over. But somehow he came here and the people loved him. You know what? I mean, when he was out here, he really was over. The Andre the Giant feud was big. I mean, Hogan, to me at the time, and obviously now, I mean, he looked like a major star waiting to happen. I didn't see how it was going to happen, that he was going to be the biggest baby face of all time. I just figured that he would be this giant heel who would be the main event wherever he went as that giant heel. Because we didn't have, aside from Andre, we didn't have giant baby faces back then. No, no. He was almost jobbed out to Andre, too. But he was so green at that time. Yeah. Um, so he, you know, the whole Comania thing started happening here. And I was in the Civic Center all those months when he was building. And, and that guy had some major baby face heat. It was great. It was a lot of fun to watch, I just said. Okay, I believe you. You know, that segues into something else I wanted to talk about. I mean, Hulk Hogan, they have Nick Bockwinkle, the heel champion. They bring Hulk Hogan in as a heel, but the fans are not having it. They love this guy. He's now a baby face. And the AWA locks into what I think was the biggest feud I had ever seen from that promotion as someone who's, you know, looking from far away, Hulk Hogan versus Nick Bockwinkle with Hulk chasing the title. Was there a feud that you saw in the AWA that was bigger than that one? Mm, crowd reaction wise and attendance wise, no. Not not no. anywhere near. The Brody Blackwell thing had a lot of heat and was very intense, but it wasn't a full building like it was for Hogan and Bachwinkle. That was the biggest thing I watched. I saw in person. People now, loved it. I had a friend of mine, Steve Walsh, who was at that show in Minneapolis where they had the Hulk Hogan dusty finish where it looked like everyone went home thinking that Hulk Hogan had won the AWA championship from Nick Bachwinkle. And the next week we go on TV and they say, oh, the, you know, the decision has been reversed. Were you at that show? Oh, God, I, I must have been. I've forgotten all. I've forgotten some of the finishes. I had to have been there. Yeah, I had to have been there. That was not Super Sunday. I think I got it written down here. February of 82 was Hogan's first shot at Bachwinkle. So that was almost a year before Super Sunday. So it was somewhere in there. But yeah, there was a, a goofy finish where <laughs> I'm 14, 13 years old, and I, I could see that it was going to get overturned. I mean, <laughs> not to make me an expert on wrestling when I'm that age, and, you know, not kayfabe. But they did send the people home for sure from the Civic Center thinking that Hogan had won the belt. They come on TV the next week and, you know, they did a switch. 
And credibility wise, that wasn't very cool. But the fans continued to buy tickets to see Hogan try to take the belt after that. So, yeah. Uh, and then at the end of the day, that's what counts. I mean, I remember, you know, I've seen some footage of the build up to that, and it reminded me of SummerSlam 93, conveniently, you know, exactly 10 years later. Like yeah. when I was watching SummerSlam 93, I'm thinking, okay, we're seeing Lex Luger getting coronated as the future of the WWF. And to this day, I think they made a big mistake not going through with that. Instead, they wanted to drag it into WrestleMania, which is just too damn long. And based on the footage I've seen, it looked like the AWA, this was going to be Hulk Hogan's night where he's going to be coronated and become the champion and become the top guy. And they like SummerSlam, they just didn't do it. Yeah, that's true. I don't want to go too far off the beaten path. There's something I wanted to throw in during this week's program. There's a certain fraternity of people on the Stick to Wrestling Facebook page and things like that. And Brandon Rice, I'm going to drop names. Brandon Rice and his family, his wife, Chloe. Brandon lost his father-in-law this last week. And I just wanted to say that our thoughts and well wishes are with the family because you know, uh, just just to watch, be a friends with Brandon Rice on Facebook. He's a real family man, and um, you know, was really bummed to hear about that. So I wanted to get that in there for Brandon. Yeah, I was actually going to wait until like things calmed down a little, and then reach out to him via instant messenger. But I, I might as well do it here. I mean, Brandon and his wife are just far too young. His, his wife, Chloe, is far too young to have lost her dad, and. Yeah. definitely our, our thoughts go out to their family. And like you said, Brandon's a real family guy. And, you know, we're, we're thinking about you, man. We're thinking about yeah. you and we're thinking about Chloe. For certain, for certain. Yep. My best friend when I was a high school kid and the guy who I went to all these AWA shows with, his name is Dave Alsacker, and he'll be listening to the show as well. He's battling a, a rough type of cancer called multiple myeloma. So we're pulling for you, Al. If you can hear this. Uh, we're thinking about you. Same here. I mean, you know, yeah. dude, cancer sucks, man. Cancer absolutely sucks. Uh, and I want your best friend to fight as hard as he can because we don't want to lose anybody, or especially yeah. around these times. Yeah, he's doing he's doing well. He's doing well with his treatment, but it, he's got an uphill battle. And uh, But, you know, I never would have made it to a lot of these shows because he had the driver's license before I did. So I just <laughs> want to tell how, how much I loved him and, you know, I'm thinking about him. All right. Yeah. Outstanding. So what was it like for you as a fan of the AWA? Like, what was the sequence? I know Hogan was booked Thanksgiving 1983 on the, for the AWA. He never made it. And then you see him on WWF TV, or I think. What, what was that sequence like for you? What did you see? Was Thanksgiving when he was booked to be on Starcade down in Crockett? Okay, the after mags had him... At Starcade, teaming with Wahoo McDaniel, but I don't think that was actually the, the plan by the promotion. I think that was, okay. by the time after ran with that, it was either outdated information or it was misinformation to begin with. Yeah. I think. It could be. I'm not sure. I'm not, not sure what the actual answer is to that, but I'm sure that he already had his contact with Vince and had agreed to jump by then, and there was no way he was showing up at Starcade. But it would have been pretty huge if he had. But obviously, Vince had already set him up pretty well. But what was what was I thinking? Was the question what was I thinking? And when he no showed, well, right? The whole the, the entire sequence, like when he didn't show up for the Thanksgiving show, like were you like, okay, where's Hogan? Is he going somewhere? Well, he was the first one really of any. To, I mean, you could see that Vince was about to do something, and he, Hogan was the first one really to jump. And I think he Hogan and Okerlund, I think, at the same time, which is actually yeah. pretty huge. I don't know, because they'd taken him away from Bachwinkle and put him in there with David Schultz and Saito. And that's where he was. He worked his last few shows because he had the car accident and the scar on his chest. And then they did the angle on TV where Saito hit him with the trophy. And that was supposedly where he got the scar on his body. But Hogan wasn't really part of the title scene that last maybe six months he was there. What did I think when he jumped? I thought it was probably pretty inevitable. As big as he got, and was I surprised at how huge he became over the next year and a half? Yes, I was surprised. But I was in the Civic Center many nights when the Eye of the Tiger would play, and that place would erupt. So, it's a good question. I know, I mean, I was surprised by the entire sequence. 
as a WWF fan, you know, I forget where I was the Saturday he debuted, but mm-hmm. like I got the news that Hogan was back and, and was back on his partner and he was back as a good guy. And I was surprised when he won the title so quickly. You know, you I was thinking these things usually get a build up, but no. Yep. I mean the, as soon as Hogan got there, they put the belt Boom. right on him. Boom. Right away. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And I know how I found out. We had a you know the, the hit station here in the Twin Cities, and he called mm-hmm. in, and I, I didn't listen to it because I wasn't into pop pop music at that time. But anyway, I, I was in gym class in high school, and somebody said, "Well, Hogan called in WLOL this morning, and he won the world championship." And I'm like, "He, he, he come again? I, you know, he mm-hmm. won the what?" And he said, "Yeah, he went to New York and got the real world championship belt." And that was the first time the people in the Twin Cities were made aware that Hogan was now the WWF champion. And uh, that's how we found out for the most part. And then, of course, Wally and Vern came out and would say, you know, some of the talent that couldn't cut it has been hired by another promotion. And they just look stupid. (laughs) That was one thing about the AWA, especially when they got on ESPN in 1985. They would not stop telling you that they were the major league of professional wrestling. They must have told us that. I'm not exaggerating. A dozen times per episode. Yeah, and there's more guys in the ring and then, counting the ring announcer and the referees and they're on the crowd. Oh, yeah. One of the questions I get asked, or, you know, some frequencies, how could I tell the AWA was losing its foothold in the Twin Cities? And the only answer I have for that is that the attendance was dropping. The Civic yeah. Center was no longer full. It was got went to half full. And, th- I mean, through 84 and 85, they were still pretty strong. But there's, you know, a couple of 1,500-seat houses in 85 for the AWA. I mean, that's minuscule compared. They had great yeah. talent still. They had still had wonderful talent. But WWF come, came to town. Their first show was on January 29th in 85. And I got this down as Andre and Mulligan against Stud and Patera for a main event. Now, that may be wrong because I think Hogan worked against Dave Schultz pretty early on. But the way I have it, when I checked out results, is Hogan didn't even appear here till March 17th of 85 with WWF. Uh, and he lost to Jesse Ventura by countout. The Dave Schultz match is in there somewhere, so I may be totally incorrect on that. But the WWF came into town and put on these awful shows awful shows but it was dividing the audience you're more familiar with the building situation out there than i am because i know they had the hogan schultz match and then they had that insane match that they spent so much time nationally promoting the hulk hogan and gene okerlund against mr fuji and george the animal steel match so i'm thinking that was just in a different building around there the only WWF show that I ever paid a ticket to see in the 1980s. They're exactly right. He teamed up with Okerlund against Fuji and Steel. And we went kind of just as a novelty. But it was a big deal. And um, yeah, I, I remember that. That was at the Met Center, which is a building between Minneapolis and St. Paul that no longer exists. It's where the Minnesota North Stars played. But it was right in the middle. And they, uh, the rent there was way higher than the Civic Center. It was like five figures at the time. It was like a $10,000 rent for one night. And uh, that's where WWF ran until they um, bought the Civic Center out from under Vern. And Vern had to move to the auditorium. So, yeah, it was a different building. It was a different building completely. And not that Vern had never run the Met Center because he did in the 60s when it was new and a couple times through the 70s and once in the 80s. But, you know, they figured it was between the two cities. It was right by the airport. But, you know, that's where they ran. No, and you know what? I'm a little bit proud of myself because I'm, I'm processing, you know, the memory I, I have of that match. I'm like, I could swear they had the green and yellow seats that were, you know, scattered all over the place. Like one seat, you'll have like two green seats and then you'll have three yellow seats and one green seat. I'm like, it's where the so, North Stars played, right? I'm so glad you brought that up. They were, they were white seats black seats, green seats, gold seats, and white seats. And I own one of each color to this day. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yep. It was the Minnesota North Stars played there, and I'm a huge hockey guy. And when they tore the building down, I was able to procure five seats from the building, one of each color. Actually, I have two white ones. But yep, you're exactly right. That's the building. My friend Steve Walsh, who's also from that area, told me that they just ran out of time 
uh, getting the seats ready. So that's why they just put them in in a scattershot manner. There was supposed to be some organization to it, but there wasn't. But at the same time, I-, I thought it looked really cool on TV, whether it be you know wrestling or if the Bruins were playing the North Stars. I'm like, wow, that's cool. You know, Steve's story may be correct. I have a different story on that. That would All have right, been cool. 1967 when they were built the building in a hurry for the North Stars to come into the NHL for the big expansion. And they put these different colored seats to make it look, you know, to trick the eye into thinking there was more fans in the building than there was when they'd have an event like Burl Live's Christmas show that drew like 79 people. So that it didn't <laughs> look empty. It kind of was like a trick of the eye sort of thing. But yeah, that's what happened. That's exactly right, though. Up to the first North Star game in 1967, they were installing seats right up until the time they opened the doors. So there you have it. There you have the the, the casino rug effect. So you can't really see if there's yeah. money on the floor or fans in the stands. Yeah, something like that, for sure. Uh-huh. Yep. So we're morphing into this question. Now we're getting into, like, I don't know, the mid to late 80s. Brad, when did the AWA start feeling less major league to you? Um, when Buddy Rose and Doug Summers had the tag belts. <laughs> that was the exact, that's my exact moment. My exact moment. Yep. That's when it, they just seem, uh, I, you know, my feelings about Buddy Rose. And I'm not, I don't, I don't hate the guy. I never hated the guy. I'm just not a big fan. And. When they got the belts, that seemed really minor league in that sense. And, you know, you see their matches now, and they're, they're pretty good. But they just didn't look. They looked like a Central State mid-card tag team to me. Yeah, that's when, I mean, the, the Titanic sunk for me, AWA-wise. And it, it was getting less and less major league feeling, you know, starting really with Hulk Hogan's departure. Yeah. And, you know, of course, Vince starts grabbing as many guys as he can but Vern starts replacing those wrestlers with guys like the Freebirds, the Road Warriors, Bruiser Brody, Stan Hansen. And by the, I want to say by spring 1986, all of those guys were gone. Yeah. And they were being replaced by guys like Scott Hall and, uh, you know, Buddy Rose. And I remember the day I was watching on WPIX, Rose and Summers won the tag team titles. It was yeah. just like, you know, this is no longer Major League Wrestling. That These are. As good, I, I thought they were a really good tag team, but I knew what Doug Summers was up until that point. He was either a medium fish in a small pond or like a, a jobber in Georgia. And Buddy Rose came across as a guy no one else wanted. And, you know, Vince wanted him. If Crockett wanted him, if Watts wanted him, that's where he would be. And, and I knew that even back then. I think it was Buddy's dream growing up in Minneapolis being Paul Pershman refereeing the Bob Winkle match where he won the belt in November 75. I think Buddy always wanted to be in the AWA. And, uh, you know, he was a huge star in Portland. He was a good worker. He worked hard. And he was in there. And he was definitely the strength of the team. But Doug Summers, I just didn't really buy. And then, of course, you put them in there with the Midnight Rockers, who were pretty green at the time. And they, Hmm. they made some magic. But the fans just, by that time, I think it was late 86 when Crockett started running at the Met Center, too. And that really, really, really muddied the waters as far as dividing up the fans. I never went to yeah. another AWA show until they got back to the Met Center for the last two shows of the existence. I went to all the Crockett shows because it was the product was so superior. But by that time, with three promotions running, even Watts ran here once. There was four yep. promotions running in a month. And it was just, there wasn't enough money and tickets and fans. I mean, and the watch show, I, I still to this day say that was the Met Center as well. The watch show, the UWF show, which, which happened the same week that they were merging with, uh, they got bought out by Crockett. There were 75 people there. Some people say, no, no, I had to be a thousand. No, there were 75 people there. There were empty seats. Oh my the God. And it was, they had the best show on TV, but nobody, nobody went because you know, it was, it was burnout. There was no, there just wasn't enough ticket money to go around, apparently. That's the thing. By 87, you had so many promotions running the cities that, I mean, fans were going to have to pick and choose which show they were going to see. It was, you know, there were, Dallas was the same way. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Dallas fell hard. Fell really hard. Yep. But they had their own, their own bunch of problems down there. But, yeah. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Now, 86 was, you know, it was, it was a great wrestling year, but at the same time, it was rough because 
by the end of the year, the AWA had gone from like, you know, okay, this is still a major league to, okay, this is like Portland, Memphis, and same thing with world class, really. Yeah, and the really ironic thing to me during that period was as the AWA was back, the Minneapolis Auditorium drawing 800 people, Kurt Henning got the belt, and he had emerged as a star, and he really didn't get what he deserved when he finally got that belt around his waist because he was tremendous and he had some great matches with Greg Gagne in the Minneapolis Auditorium. And I know a lot of people will scoff at that because of Greg Gagne, but they had some terrific matches where the fathers got involved, Larry and, and Byrne, and uh, they had some great matches, but you could tell that Kurt was going places and he did. But unfortunately he had to get the belt when no one was showing up anymore. So it's hard. I think Greg Gagne is a tremendously underrated worker. He was small, and I don't think he would have gotten that push anywhere but his dad's promotion. But you know, the guy could work. The guy absolutely could work. Yeah, he could. And it was just his look. And the word I always got on, on Greg, and I've come to accept it, and I hope it's accurate, is that Greg had mononucleosis very badly as a teenager, and it damaged his liver. And he quote-unquote, wanted to go on the gas, as Brunzel was. Greg wanted to go on the gas, but his body wouldn't tolerate it. And that that's really, it, it's kind of sad, but it's probably one of the reasons why he's alive at 70-plus today. But, yeah, he had great interviews, great intensity. He was older than they kind of portrayed him, you know, once he became a single wrestler, even in the high flyers. But, yeah, if Greg just done, had a little bit more of a physique, I think it would have worked just fine. Well, they found the right role for him, and that's always good. Now, another reason to join our Facebook page, Stick to Wrestling, we will occasionally take questions, and we ask for a few AWA questions. I want to thank those who contributed. We'll go first with David Ferguson. Who would you have liked to see challenge Nick Bockwinkle for the AWA that never got a shot? Okay, well, uh, let me see. In his first title reign, late 75 to 1980, I've got notes down here that he did travel a lot, defended the belt all over the country. He was the only AWA champion to really do that. Byrne didn't do it. Byrne didn't really work a full-time schedule after the mid-60s. Yeah. So he did travel a lot, defended belts. It's a really tough question that this gentleman has asked. I wish he would defended more often in the home territory rather than be used in six-man tags. He, Nick forgot Bachwinkle would usually only, and I'm not answering the question directly, I apologize, but Bachwinkle would only probably do four title defenses a year in the major market in the auditorium, St. Paul, Minneapolis. You know, Bachwinkle did a series with Andre the Giant. He had a 60-minute Broadway with Andre the Giant in his belt. And uh, he had 60-minute draws with Jim Brunzel, circa 76. Who would I have liked to have seen? That's a tough question. Do you have any ideas on that one, John, on his first reign? Well, you know what? I gave David's question just an overwhelming amount of thought i I spent so much time with this i'm like okay do we want a very traditional awa wrestler uh you know someone like jim brunzel or someone like billy robinson or do we want to go like way outside of that and bring in someone that the awa has never seen anyone like before and i'm going in the middle i i think if nick bockwinkle had had a series of matches in his prime against Paul Orndorff, who's kind of a nice mix of that wrestler. I mean, sure. Orndorff, people forget this. Orndorff was a really good babyface in Mid-South Wrestling, and yep. I think he would have gotten over huge in the AWA. He has the amateur background. He's got the football background. Ultimately, i go with him. Yep. I think it bears mentioning that I think more now more as the as the decades have gone by and their life's speeding up, as I know, um, and as you probably know, life speeds up, but I think Nick Bockwinkle is always a babyface waiting to happen or always a, a tweener champion waiting to happen. I think the fans wanted to like him. The Adnan Yal Casey feud bared that likeness out. I think that Bobby Heenan was there to make damn sure that Bockwinkle never did turn babyface. And if like someone like Brody had come in, you know, in 1978 or 79 when he was working for Bruiser, but if Brody had come in as the heel and worked against Bockwinkle, I think it would have worked. I know they worked together in Southwest and in Houston, but that was during sec- Bachwinkle's second reign. But uh, yeah. yeah, I think Nick, I, the fans like they, they liked him, you know, and he carried himself well. But Heenan would come out and rant and rave and and you know spit all over people. And Heenan was just kind of a just to make there to make sure that 
because I don't think Bakung and Heenan were even that close as people. But I think he was there to just make sure cement the, Bachwinkle's role as a heel. Second reign, they kept him very busy. 81 onward. Uh, he's kept very busy. Jill traveled. They threw everyone at him. They had, he had matches against Ringens. Some great matches against Martel. He had Hogan, of course. He had the Otto Vons, et cetera. They kept him very busy during the reign. So who would I have liked to have seen him wrestle against? They could have bring in someone like Rick Steamboat. It would have been tremendous. About 81, 82. Someone like Ted DiBiase. Just guys that we were just never going to see in the AWA because there wasn't a spot for them. But I think yeah. that they would have been good. Yeah. Here's something that I just thought of, and I'm glad I thought of it. Mm-hmm. From the moment I started buying wrestling magazines in 1976, mm-hmm. uh, not from the moment, but I would say building up, like towards the late 70s, I'm like, okay, this Bockwinkel Heenan split with Bockwinkel becoming a babyface looked mm-hmm. inevitable to me, but they never pulled the trigger on it. I mean, did you think they were ever going to split up? Yes, I did. I thought at times that when Hogan came in, that Hogan was going to be aligned with Heenan and Bachwinkle was going to be the baby face. I thought that that was maybe possibly what they were doing. Cause I didn't understand what Johnny Valiant was doing, managing Hulk Hogan. Right. I didn't understand why they wouldn't just automatically put him with Heenan because Heenan was yeah. the heel manager and they didn't, it wasn't like the WWF where they had three heel managers. I thought there was a possibility that they may have thought that I also know you know, knowing Vern being Vern probably saw nothing in Hogan at first, you know, just thought he was a big guy. But yeah, that's, that's an excellent question. I could have seen Bachwinkle turning baby. He, he actually and eventually did. The fans loved him, but it was right at the end of his career. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I thought by that point, I thought it was overdue. But anyway, yeah. Pete Pingle wants to know, where do you rank Rick Martell along with the other AWA champions such as Ganya and Bachwinkle. Brad, what do you think? As a champion, he was just as good a worker as anybody. He had weak opponents. Uh, we mentioned Bringens, Backlund, Michael Hayes. Not, you know, top-tier guys, I don't think. I mean, Brad Ringens could stretch you any way he wanted to, but the fans just didn't want to buy it. They, wanted, they brought in Backlund. I mean, Backlund got booed. You know, people just didn't want to see that. And then I've got the note about, about him healing against Lawler in Louisville and how much fun that was. And we mentioned that early on the podcast. I just think that Martel came in at the wrong time. Had it happened two or three years earlier, I think he would have been a lot better. But I think as a champion and as a, you know an ambassador in that sense, I thought he was terrific. I thought he was just as good. I mean, I loved Rick Martel, and he was put in a top spot. I mean, it, there yeah. he's got the title right after Bobby Heenan leaves. Like if I think if Bobby had stayed there and Rick Martell, you know, if Bobby had been the glue to keep that together, Rick Martell would have been a way better champion. But I mean, I personally think that as great a worker as Rick Martell is, as much of a fan that I am, I mean, you just can't compare him to Gagne and Bockwinkel because he only had the title for what, a year and a half? Yeah. And the, you know, the walls were caving in during that time. And, yeah. and the, the crowds are really dwindling and it was, it was sad and he deserved better, but he, I think in the ring, he was every bit of, as much of a performer, you know, he was, he was great that the accent, I don't know whether it helped him or hurt him, but I, I know that it, when I came, when the bell rang, he was always a hard worker. Great. He put on the best match he could. It would have been interesting to see him, you know, do a little more heel work. And I don't know what's out there as far as the tapes and Jerry Lawler and things like that. It's the one match I'm aware of, but yeah. I think he was tremendous. But yeah, you know, you can't really mention him in the same paragraph as Bachwinkle or Vern because he, he didn't have it very long. But he was great no. when he had it. Yeah. yeah. I Like I said, I, I bought him as a world champion. Uh, I mean, two quick Rick Martell thoughts. Number one, I've mentioned this on the show before, the, the wrestling show that I still kick myself for missing is the December 28th, 1985 show when my friends wanted to go to the Meadowlands, hey, let's drive down there. And I'm like, no, I got to go to Montreal the next day. And you know, I would have gotten to see Stan Hansen win the title from Rick Martell. Mm-hmm. And then Rick Martell disappeared from AWA TV right after that. Yeah, and I was did. saying to myself, why isn't Crockett going? Or why isn't the NWA going after this guy? He'd be a great opponent for Ric Flair. Yeah, he would have. 
Didn't he? Didn't he go to Vince Land and become a Strike Force or whatever they were called? What was it? I, uh, yeah, that memory. was like October, November, nineteen eighty-six. But you know, he didn't go right to the WWF. He was kind of, you know, where is Rick Martel and why isn't he in a major league promotion? But anyway, he's very taking t- some time off. Yeah. Yeah, you know what? That's a good point. I mean, I know he was working for the Montreal promotion, and you're right. Maybe he was just kicking it back. Jerry Joy wants to know, how could they have made Jerry Lawler's AWA title reign a success to build off of? What do you think, Brad? Well, I got a heads up on some of these questions. I read the page, obviously. Lawler's reign more successful. I just put the two words. I put too late. Yeah. In Memphis, it worked. It was great. Lawler deserved it. He was as over as he needed to be to be the champion. He drew pretty well in Memphis as the champion, but then they, they watered it in with the world class, and then they had that schmaz. But as far as in the AWA land, Lawler had the belt when it was just over. It was too late. It was over. Yeah. yeah. I, and I, I agree with you. I think Jerry Lawler as AWA champion was phenomenal. That was a great, mm-hmm. you know, 18 months late, you know, the second half of 87 and then into 1988, I think his interviews were maybe even the best in the business, and he knew how to get that belt over, which, of course, he's also getting himself over. But like you said, and I thought it was good that he traveled to world class, that he traveled to continental, that he actually went to Portland once with the belt. So he's, Mm. he's making it look like... You know, hey, this is the World's Heavyweight Championship. WWF, that's a company title. The NWA, that's a company title. I defend the title to whoever, and he would challenge Flair and Hogan. So he made the best out of that situation that he possibly could. It's just you could only go so far with that situation. I I agree wholeheartedly, yeah. It was very true. I mean, even the after mags made it. You know, Hogan is just a a one-league champion, but the the other two are, are traveling champions, and I mean, Lawler was still really a great performer at that stage in his career. It just, as far as the Twin Cities and the major ADBA stronghold markets, it was just too late. Yeah, and by the way, the Meaptor magazine started that when Bob Backlund was champion, and they refused to credential any of the Pro Wrestling Illustrated guys as ringside photographers. But anyway, you're my- exactly right. That's what happened. They, Vince wouldn't let him shoot at ringside, and. Yeah. Okay, I'm not going to recognize your world title. That's exactly right. Yeah, after there was like downtown Bruno trying to fight Mike Tyson. It's just you can yeah. throw as many punches as you want. It doesn't matter. Mike Zaplinski, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, was Vern's death grip on the AWA title an inspiration for Hulk Hogan's self centric style? What do you think, Brad? I said no. Hogan floundered for years down in Knoxville and then in Memphis. And uh, even WWF, when he was there, it wasn't clicking. It, it didn't click until he got to the AWA. Vern's mentality, I, 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 I think Hogan kind of you know, told Vern in so many words and actions to stick it. I don't really see that. Yeah. Vern owned the territory. I mean, for decades when he didn't really have to worry about somebody double crossing him, except maybe Billy Robinson. But yeah, I, I don't really see that, that Hogan... I think Vince made him a lot of promises. I think they went in together as a team, but I think that's where Hogan got really, you know, the, his ego really got inflated is when he went back to New York. You know, I have a ton of respect for Vern Gagne, but he had a huge ego. I mean, the fact that he had to retire with the AWA title when that clearly was not in the nah. best interest of his own promotion. Great you know, I, I mean, Yeah, I mean, they're both, you know... He wouldn't drop the AWA tag team titles with Mad Dog Vashon. I mean, we, we have a pattern going here. But yeah. in, in fairness, you know, Vern owned the promotion, so we could do whatever he wanted. And if it hurt business, well, that's on him. And at the end of the day, it didn't hurt business. Hogan never owned the promotion, but he was really selfish at times. So I don't think really that Hogan ever said, well, I'm going to be like Vern and do all this stuff. But there were similarities. Yeah. And you could throw in Brody and Hanson, too, in that in that paragraph, too. I mean, that we're, weren't going to cooperate all the time, you know, because they were looking out for themselves. So, yeah, I absolutely agreed. Yeah, I mean, well, not to go off the rails, but I, I think Brody and Hanson 
they were the way they were for business reasons. It wasn't really an e- it didn't feel like an ego thing to me. With Hogan and Vern, it felt like an ego thing. Same with Dusty. Same with probably ten other guys like I could name. Yeah, you're probably right on that. It's just you know Vince met up with Hogan in Japan and probably made him an offer, and and that was the end of it. I mean, it just mm-hmm. happened that way. Yeah. No, nope. Vince knew what he was doing, and he yeah. knew the guy he wanted to do it with, and you know it, it all worked. Finally, Steve Crawford asks, "How should Stan Hansen have been booked as the AWA World Champion?" I got the words too late after that one too. He was being challenged by Jerry Blackwell, who was sadly nearing the end of his life, and you know he had the matches against Bockwinkel. Uh, how could he have been better? I don't know that there was a whole lot of trust in Stan Hansen because he had that Japanese photographers are at ringside mentality and doesn't want to look bad. Because that's where they made their money. That's where Stan and, and Frank made their money overseas in Japan. Um, yeah. How could he have been used better? I don't know. Maybe not so many goofy sketches with Larry Nelson. That's yeah. my exact answer. <laughs> Kindred spirits. <laughs> yeah, that was just really cartoonish, I think. Very cartoonish, as Spaceman Frank Hickey would say. But yeah, not so many of those goofy... Uh, Get with Larry Nelson. I mean, that was my answer. I, I was fine with the way he was booked. I was fine with him as a world champion. I saw him again in that rarefied air. Yeah, he would be compare him to Hogan. Okay, well, these, the, he's just as good as Hogan. He's just as good as Flair, just as credible. But I had seen him in the WWF. I'd seen him in Georgia. And he didn't have that goofy persona that he started <laughs> using in the AWA with the tobacco juice all over the place and screaming at his wife. wife. Yep, yep. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I, that was the one thing that I would have changed. And also, you know, this is the story I got a long time ago. You know, Stan was allied with Baba. Baba had the expectation that Stan was going to be AWA champion when he booked him on that tour of June 1986. And for Vern yeah. to say, you know, no, Stan, we don't want to have the belt out of the country for four weeks or whatever. You're losing to Nick Bockwinkel in Denver. Like, I'm sorry. That one's on Vern. Yeah. I just recently, for the first time, saw the interview that they did backstage in Denver at McNichols Arena, I believe it was, when uh, they're, to, you know, they're interviewing Bockwinkel. And, you know, you're the new AWA champion. What do you make of this? And he's, I'm happy as hell. And, you know, Stanley didn't want to cut show up and. You know, and all that. When we know that Stan made it into the building and found out he wasn't going to win with the belt, and he took off with the belt. To yeah. Throw over it and stuff like that. But, uh, jeez. <laughs> I mean, they were drawing, like, in the hundreds by that time. So it's it's just really hard. You put two guys like Bockwinkel and Hanson on top of a card, and you can only draw 400 people. Something's broken. I am with you. And, you know, one last thing. Like, I, I've been very critical of Vern, you know, retiring with the belt and Bockwinkle being handed the belt. This one was a little bit different because mm-hmm. of the way they put it on TV. They said, oh, it's a forfeit because Stan Hansen wouldn't defend the title. So I thought at least that made a little bit of sense. Yeah, made him look a little chicken shit on that as far as that yep. goes. Because, yeah, and it was done a lot better than the one where they were in the, the wood panel Fritz von Erich-esque office of Stanley Black in 1984. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. Bradley, this has been an outstanding episode. I want to thank you for taking the time. Oh, thank you so much for having me on. I appreciate it greatly. No, it's a, it's a pleasure. And I want to thank our producer, Lightning Lou Kippelman, for all of the great work he does. Believe me, a lot of things don't go perfectly when we record this. And then Lou makes it sound like it all went smoothly and perfectly. So thank you. I want thank to thank you. everyone for listening. And this has been a production of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. We'll see you next week. This concludes our podcast day.